Hello, and glad to have you along for another edition of Press Row. We're joined by the usual cast of characters, Todd Walker, Aaron Matthews, Mark Kuntz. I'm Matt Finkel. On to week four, or on past week four now, and on to week five. And week four brought a couple of good games in the MAC. Who are you more impressed with pulling out the victory? Coldwater over St. Henry or Marion Local over Minster in what turned into a pretty good battle over at Memorial Field? Uh, I think I just continue to be impressed with the cold water body of work, you know, 143 to six. Uh, that, that's a pretty good four game run they've got going, uh, you know, and I guess if you want to talk about who was more impressive last week, maybe even you still go with cold water. They throw a shutout on the road against St. Henry. That, that's uh, pretty impressive, but uh, both of them were impressive. Uh, I, I guess I'll lean toward cold water here. Last week, remember guys, we asked the question, uh, who would, when would Coldwater give up points? And I honestly thought it would be against St. Henry. Didn't happen, so we're still aiming towards October 9th <laughs> with the matchup uh, between Coldwater, Marion, local. But I, I mean, that's very impressive that they shut out St. Henry the way they did. St. Henry came in as the number three team in the state in the division there leading into that game. But also at the same time, you know, look at what Marion local did to Minster on the flip side. Another week of uh, two state champions doing battle and. Uh, you know, Marion Local proceeded in that matchup, too. St. Henry came into that matchup with Coldwater averaging over 25 points a game. They were shut out. 20th straight win for the Cavs over St. Henry, a streak that reaches over 19 years because of the playoff win Coldwater had over St. Henry a couple years ago back in, down in Wapakoneta. But I was actually more impressed with what Marion Local did to Minster. Not only the fact that they won that game, but the way they won that game. They completely controlled the ball. They, their way to beat Minster was not allow the Minster offense to touch the ball. Really long drives from Marion Local, ran the ball, took a lot of time off the clock, and simply just played keep away from the defending state champs. And that's how Marion Local happened to win it this week. They're finding different ways to win depending upon what they need, need to do to win each week. And that's one of your signs of a great coaching staff. Aaron Neatfeld had three touchdowns for the Flyers in that win. And what were you going to say, Todd? I was going to say I'd agree with the great coaching staff, but the that doesn't bode well for when you come up against cold water. When you're finding ways to win, that's great. But usually those things you find against other teams, you don't find against cold water the way they look now. And you've got to believe that could be a, a lower scoring game since uh, both teams appear to be pretty good at stopping people or playing keep away in Marion Local's case. So we'll see how it goes in a couple of weeks. I was at that Coldwater St. Henry game and I was thinking of you, Aaron, when the you have shorts on or something? No, no, no. Well, I did have shorts on, but <laughs> avoiding some rain as well. But Coldwater throws a pick. Hemelgarn gets picked off, and Saint, this is in the second quarter, and St. Henry takes it inside the 25. And on the very next play, I'm like, this is it. They're gonna, you know, something's going to happen here. On the very next play, Kyle McKibben picks off Mitchell Salmon, and they're going the other way with it. So, yeah, they're really tough to score on. Now that we have a common opponent, though, do you have a favorite for that Week 7 matchup between Coldwater and Marion? They're Ask both me in Week 7. I, right now, if, if they were to play this week, I would lean towards Cavaliers because of the defense, the yeah. way that that defense is playing. Yeah, I didn't need the common opponent. Uh, Coldwater's not going to be beaten is the way I feel right now. Okay. Well, we'll see what happens week I seven. I have a feeling they're both going to be undefeated when they play. Let's yeah. Well, there. there's no doubt when they play each other, they'll be undefeated. But I would, I would lean toward Coldwater. Looking forward to that one. In the Western Buckeye League, Wapak, another win. A lot of challenge the Redskins, though. So is this a blueprint for how to beat Travis Moyer's team? And will they be beaten? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I thought Elida, you know, their defense maybe kind of wore down there late in that game. Mm -hmm. Uh, but Wapkinetta's defense is pretty good, too. I mean, Light has been putting up some pretty good offensive numbers, and they got 14 points, which is below their norm. So I'm not going to say Wapak would run the table, but I still think they're the clear favorite right now to win that league. Uh, you know, can they win six more in a row without losing? Uh, I'm might not willing to go out on that limb just yet, but they're, they're still the class of the league to me. Well, clearly, Elida gives the rest of the WBL hope that they could beat Wapakoneta. Because sure. remember, Bulldogs led that game with four and a half minutes to go in the fourth quarter. Wapak scored to take the lead, then got another touchdown late to make it a little bit more of a blowout than, right. than what it was really in reality. You look at the remaining part of Wapakoneta's schedule. They're at Bath this week, home for Salina, travel to Defiance, at OG, home for St. Mary's, at Van Wert. WBL is, is tough. One through seven, one through eight, the WBL is very tough. So whether or not Wapakoneta is going to be able to go through that undefeated for a second straight season, that's going to be one of the interesting storylines of the last second, month of the year. Second year in a row that those two teams have been very close going into the fourth quarter, even into the fourth. Last year, Wapak shut out Eli to 17-0 at Kraft Stadium. This year, that 31-14, as you mentioned, 
late score, put that away. That game went back and forth throughout the second half. I was actually listening to it uh, for most of the night. But I think when you look at Walpock, you've still got St. Mary's. Granted, it's early as far as how the Rough Riders being 4-0 and right now. I know Talking about a team finding a way to win games. Absolutely, especially last week when they come back down 17-7 at halftime to win 42-23 in the second half of that win. But back to Wapak for a minute. Uh, Travis Moyer, all this guy does is win 72 consecutive regular season victories after last Friday night. Yeah, it's impressive. I was circling St. Mary's, and I think you said it was St. Mary's Van Wert back-to-back -to, -back yeah. to end the season yep. for them. Mm -hmm. And even though the Cougs have two losses, I can see them especially getting to Week 10, putting up a good fight. So that, that might be the two that... Well, and you know, the other thing, you bring up the Cougars, they're a big up-front team. They, they can really pound in. I think maybe Wapkin is a little bit vulnerable there. Elida lives on that run game with the quarterback a lot, but also with Cole Harmon. And I think they did show that maybe a team that can power run, control the game with the, the ground attack, can maybe stay with Wapakoneta and beat them. So the Cougars could be a candidate. Well, right? and looking ahead of that match, part of the, the success Wapakoneta's had offensively has been getting the ball to Cameron Locke, get, letting him get around the edges. You can't do that against Van Wert. Van Wert's got great team speed, particularly sideline to sideline defensively. Plenty of times last week against Shawnee, Shawnee was able to get the ball to guys in space, but that space quickly evaporated because the Van Wert closing speed was so quick on the edge. Interesting to see how that WBL plays out. We will watch it closely. Meanwhile, Harden Northern is 3-1. and one. Do they have a chance to make the playoffs? If the playoffs started today, they would be the 8th seed in Region 26. I get to see them Friday night. I know that much. Well, you look at the rest of Harden Northern's schedule. 9-15 and 15 is the record of the, the remaining schedule for the Polar Bears. And four of those nine wins come in Week 10 when they play Riverside. Riverside 4-0, Harden Northern 3-1. Those are the only two teams in the NWCC with winning records. So Hard Northern, clearly there are some wins out there for the Polar Bears. They're all, most of those games are all in their same region that they're in, Region 24 and Division 7. So I, I think Hard Northern keeps on winning. They can hold on to that eight spot. Well, yeah, I think it's pretty clear if you look at where they are now as opposed to maybe projecting some wins in their league based on what we've seen out of everybody else. Absolutely, they have a chance. and It's just sheer mathematics. You know, there's a, a fallacy that every team that gets in the playoffs is a good team. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, they're in generally what we call the weakest region. Uh, the fewest points needed to get in year after year is in that region. So there's no question they could get in the playoffs. They could have an 8-2 and two record, let's say. I mean, that's not far-fetched. It's probably good enough to get in. Let's just remember, though, we're talking about a hard northern team that's two years removed from not having varsity football. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's the real story. Two years ago, they didn't have a varsity football team, and now they've found a way to get in the Northwest Central Conference. Now they're three and one here in the pre-conference season. Well, they were two and one. Now they're in league play. But yeah, that that would be a great resurrection story. Absolutely. Well, and it speaks to the importance of if you have low numbers and you don't think you have enough seniors on your team, keep your JV programs going because yes. then it just becomes a hiccup. You can get that varsity team back up. If you kill both varsity and JV, that's a little bit more difficult to come back from. Just, to, I mean, overall, a tip of the cap to, to Mike Dennis, yeah, the head coach at Harden Northern, and the job that he's done. And he has stuck through this whole thing. Yeah. They've been through a litany of coaches, a bunch of guys that were one and done that just couldn't take the heat, and just couldn't take the low numbers. And for whatever reason, you know, it's been, you know, the weird thing is, is this is a hard Northern program that, you know, 12, 11, 12, ago. even 10 years 10 ago, years ago yeah. was a state champion. And now, you know, they have gone, they've hit rock bottom. They've come back up. You alluded to the JV. And I think that was a smart move on their part by, you know, still keeping those, playing those JV games, playing against some of these sophomores and juniors and other programs that don't get the opportunity to play varsity football, take your licks that way, but still learn and grow. Mike's been there. He's been the constant through all this. And, you know, nice to see this man getting rewarded here. They're off to a good start. We'll see if they can keep it up this Friday night. They've got Fort Laramie in a game that's going to be on WOSN. And Fort Laramie, a team that, you know, has been a playoff team the last few years. And they're off to an 0-4 start. A little bit of a surprise there, too. They've played a tough schedule. They have. They yeah. have played a tough schedule. But, yeah, certainly a surprise that they're 0-4. You know what else it brings up, Mark? You talked about how they had to go to just a JV program for a while. But they also got out of the BVC. And it makes you wonder if some other schools might consider it. it. It seems to be happening in some of the small school leagues more than the big school leagues. There seems to be disparities from top to bottom that there didn't used to be back in the day. And uh, there are a number of schools that maybe 
thinking about rearranging things isn't such a bad idea. Well, and also keep in mind, part of the what happened with the BVC was there was a serious threat from some of the larger BV school members to branch off, start a, a different league because right. of the fact that the smaller schools in the BVC, they weren't solid in football. They weren't sure if Hard Northern was going to field a football team. There's always a concern about Van Lu having enough kids to play football. Same so, with Arcadia. So there was a concern by some of the large members of the BVC, and that's why they reached out and expanded to the Hopewell Loudons and the North Baltimore's to, to solidify the larger part of the BVC at the expense of the smaller schools. And right now right. it is working for Hard Northern. Yeah. Yeah. And just to piggyback on what you were saying quickly, Aaron, is that the seniors, when we talked to them during the warm-up, they, they were very open about the struggles that they had, and it's nice to see them get some victories here in their yes, senior year and absolutely. see it through. So we'll see how they fare against Fort Warmie in their NWCC matchup. On to college football now. There's some Big Ten versus MAC games this week. Five of them. There's five of them. Okay, including Ohio State. Do we see a MAC team beating a Big Ten team? And if so, which one? Ooh, ooh, yeah. Ooh, yours, I got one. Yours is my favorite. Yours <laughs> what, what are yeah. we when Mr. Cotter's got, class here? Yeah. <laughs> got a uh, sweat I got, hog with an answer? I got BG at Purdue. Yeah, How about I think that's that? the best <laughs> one. Yeah. Well, uh, BG is the lone Mac school with a win over the Big Ten this year. Big Ten 6-1 and one against the Mac coming into this week. And I, I, I could see BG winning, but I'm going to go with a, a heart pick that's talked the head oh, into agreeing no, with it. The Bobcats. Ohio goes up to Minnesota. If Minnesota plays like they did last week where they, they only beat Kent State 10-7, to yeah. seven, I think the Bobcats can pick up the victory in Minneapolis. You know, I, I thought the same thing. Uh, I like where the Bobcats are right now. I think they're kind of under the radar. They've played some pretty good teams and, and won. And Minnesota last week, I mean, Frank Kill, or Frank Kill, Jerry Kill. They say basketball yeah, season, yeah, big homie. He says, you know, what, what is our problem? We beat Kent State 10 to 7. What is going on here? I don't know what's going on with Minnesota, but I think the Bobcats have a fighting chance. Guys, it was last Saturday night as the Ohio State game with Northern Illinois was winding down. I was talking with Jason Aldridge since both of us had the LCC game against Trenton Edgewood. And Jason and I were part of the broadcast crew with you, Todd, to uh, beat, you know, beat having Purdue. to go to Northern, having you know, beat Purdue. We were talking about Northern. You, know, you don't sweat on this team for the last decade. That being said, did you guys see by chance that now ESPN has Kirk Herbstreet's son Making upset picks, I, and he's I saw two for two. About that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He took Northern Illinois to beat Boston College on Saturday. How about that? That being said, BG over yeah. Purdue on Saturday. Yeah, yeah and I, I pity Western Michigan, to be honest with you, because <laughs> they're going to feel the wrath of uh, all the bad things Ohio State did last week. So they won't be able to row the boat. Then. They, they'll row the boat, get paid, row the boat home. The That's other Big Ten Mac matchups yes. this week, you got Central Michigan taking on Michigan State, Ball State against undefeated Northwestern. Right. I know Central Michigan has a history of beating Michigan State, there's no doubt. but That'd be number two Michigan State. Yeah. Yes, I don't think Sparty's going to let that happen this I year. I think the directional Michigans might have a rough week against the Big Ten. All right, let's close with the NFL. The Browns, Johnny Manziel, I don't want to say look good because he only completed eight of 15 passes, but he did what he, he needed to do. He got the W. That's all that matters. He, needed to, he did what he needed to do to get the Browns a win, and then promptly is now back to the second string with McCown coming back from the concussion. He's named the starter. Is this the right move for Cleveland? No. Whatever is going to happen, you know the Browns are going to make the wrong move. Yeah. It's ipso facto. Whatever the Browns do, it's going to be the wrong move, but I can understand why they make this decision. I mean, let's face it. McCown won the job coming into this season. He didn't necessarily play poorly against the Jets. He got hurt against the Jets in week one. So whatever he did during the training camp, whatever he did during preseason was enough to win him the job. They're going to go back to him. Manziel gave some excitement last week. I'll, I'll give him that. Him and Travis Benjamin yeah. gave some excitement. But Special teams player of the week. Yep. Now, I, I'm of that old school adage of you don't lose your job to injury. Therefore, I agree with the decision that McCown should have the job this week. If he's ineffective, maybe they pull the Bill O'Brien, Brian Hoyer, and uh, Ryan, Ryan Mallett, Mallett thing yeah. and you know, pull the old switcheroo in the third quarter. But I think McCown deserves to have a chance this week. They are playing the Raiders, who got a big win against Oakland, a team that you know, looked completely different than they did when they played the Bengals and got run out of uh, the O.co, whatever the heck they call that place anymore. Uh, baseball. The mausoleum. Yeah, football with – infield dirt in the middle of Come it. Come on, now, that used to be atrocious. such a great old school look. How it many new stadiums to. used to have that? You used to have that Atlanta and Cleveland, all those real grass. San Diego used to have it before you had all the turf and all the cutouts, but the real grass with the infield, the horrible footing in the Cleveland end zone every year because of it with the goalpost on the pitcher's mound. Oh, back when football was football. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, as far as the and Browns. And not nap time. 
Yeah. As far as the Browns go, though, uh, I think it is the right move. I mean, McCown's a veteran. Well, let's not forget Manziel two weeks ago couldn't throw. He had a sore elbow. So you don't even know if he can play a full season at this point without getting hurt. And McCown is a, a veteran presence. I think Coach Petten will lean on that. And you can always go to Johnny later if you need to. Uh, this is the right move, I think. All right. Well, we will see if Manziel remains on the bench or makes his way back into the game. That's going to do it for this week's Press Row. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you out there over the weekend.